We love the ability to have a business that solves truly meaningful global problems that do improve people's lives, be that um, uh, uh, on a security aspect or be that on a climate change aspect. Welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO Interviews, informed conversations with the best and brightest CEOs in the publicly traded markets. Quality of leadership is a decisive factor in stock performance. Our show provides intimate and in-depth investing discussions with industry leaders across all sectors of the marketplace. We publish excerpts on social media platforms and the full conversations on SeekingAlpha.com or on our highly rated Seeking Alpha mobile app under CEO Interviews. Welcome to Seeking Alpha. I'm your host, Jesse Redmond. Today, I'm joined by Peter Platzer, CEO of Spire Global. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Jesse. I'm excited to be here. Let's kick it off with an overview. How would you describe Spire Global to somebody that's not familiar with the business? Spire is a company that collects data in space to solve problems on Earth. And it does so in a very, very unique and incredibly powerful way. Namely, it is using radio frequencies to observe what is happening on Earth or above Earth. So, for example, we are tracking uh, about $17 trillion of global trade. We're tracking the movements in the $2 trillion uh, global aerospace and aviation industry, um, about uh, 20 five to $30 trillion of global GDP are impacted by the weather, which we track and predict all across the globe up to 10 days out. And how big is the opportunity set? Help us understand the TAM for your type of business. So we estimate that the TAM is about $100 billion by 2025 and about 200,000 uh, customers. So it is an exceptionally large opportunity set where today we are serving about 600 of those customers. So it is uh, still very early on in that uh, capturing of that market where indeed we are the leaders. We are, um, are a vertically integrated company. We build all of our technology, the software, the hardware, the space technology, the ground technology, the cloud technology, the AI, the machine learnings, all of that is vertically integrated inside Spire. Um, we own and operate the world's largest constellation of satellites for this type of Earth observation using radio frequencies. It's the world's largest multi-purpose satellite constellation, over 100 satellites. So fully vertically integrated um, uh, inside Spire that allows us to innovate and stay ahead of the curve quite easily and quite straightforwardly. And is this, a, is this a competitive space? Could you kind of walk us through what you see as the competitive landscape and how you're most di differentiated against those competitors? That's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question, Jesse. And uh, there's been so much activity in leveraging space to solve problems on earth that people are you know, sometimes at least a little bit overwhelmed. And so we give them a framework to think about this. Uh, first, an analogy. In the logistics industry, you know, you have aircraft, you know, you have ships and you have trucks. And all of them, of course, they have windows, they have engines, they have wheels, they have passengers, they have captains, they have steering wheels. Um, but everyone understands that a plane, um, a ship and a truck are very, very different from each other. It's the same in leveraging space to solve problems on earth. Unfortunately, we'll call everything a satellite. But there are three distinct groups of satellites. There are what we call looking satellites, talking satellites, and listening satellites. Looking satellites, of course, they use the reflection from the sunlight on the surface of the, uh, of the Earth to capture images of Earth. They're basically, cameras in space works really well during the day and good weather. Uh, and at night doesn't work when there's bad weather, there are problems. But that are the looking satellites. Then you have the talking satellites. Those are satellites that provide some form of communication, be that you know, TV or be that internet or cell phone. Um, and uh, uh, they, they kind of like provide that bandwidth connectivity. Um, fun fact there, about 95% of the world's population lives on just 3% of the world's surface area. So that means those satellites as they fly around earth, 
they actually only get to be busy about 3% of the time. So you got a pretty weak asset utilization, which means um, you end up with very, very large constellations. Some people call them mega constellation of thousands or 5,000 satellites. And then you have the listening uh, satellites. So those are satellites that use the radio frequency spectrum to observe what is happening on or around Earth. Now, the nice thing about RF is uh, that it works during day and during night, and it works in all weather conditions. So you have a really, really nice um, um, acid utilization, so to speak. And it often also delivers to you information in 3D, you know, three dimensions, rather than just two dimensions as when you take a picture. Um, and lastly, it can capture data all across the world in a meaningful way, like, you know, the movement of ships or planes or the weather, which is truly happening all across the earth, rather than let's say only in, in, in a highly populated areas. And Spire is the leader in that listening satellite category. And walk us through the four sets, sets of solutions. And doing my research, the sets that I came up with were maritime, aviation, weather, and space services. A, do those sound accurate? And B, can you give us a bit of context around those four? They are absolutely accurate, and I'm happy to give you a context on it. Um, maritime, of course, is related to tracking everything that is happening on the ocean. And even though the earth is like 70, 75% water, it is mostly out of sight, out of mind for us. So it is actually not something that we have, generally speaking, an everyday sense of. There are about half a million large vessels that spy tracks every single day that walk around the oceans. Some of the industries and some of the use cases um, uh, and challenges in the maritime industry are almost funny, but still very, very large. Like piracy, for example, which is costing the global shipping industry $10 billion today, rather than just being a funny movie with Johnny Depp. Um, so uh, 90 plus percent of global trade happens on the ocean, some $17 trillion of goods. And the only way to track who is shipping what, where, and when is actually through a large satellite constellation. Because as soon as a ship leaves land, the curvature of the Earth after 50 miles makes it impossible to listen to data from that ship, which means the ship itself might know where it is and where it's going, but literally no one else does unless you have a satellite connectivity. So you have um, uh, uh, commodity traders that want to know where's all the oil and gas in the world, something which you might appreciate is quite relevant, particularly today um, as of right now because of the geopolitical situation. Or you might have a, a port, you know, the largest port in Europe is, uh, is the port of Rotterdam and they have a, a, a leadership vision of, of net zero of uh, carbon neutral you know, shipping operations. And they chose uh, Spire to buy even more data from us to help them drive and achieve that vision. But of course, the port of Rotterdam is one of the largest and most prominent ports in the world, but it is just one of like thousands of ports across, um, uh, across the world. Um, so those is the, this is the maritime segment you know, that we just talked about. Um, aviation, is everything to do with the movement of the aircraft, uh, be that um, uh, a small business jet where, you know, let's say a trader might be interested to know um, where Jeff Bezos is landing his or her chap, or um, you might have seen uh, the article a little while ago where someone was tracking where um, Elon Musk was flying his aircraft and what kind of like uh, business deals could be derived from that. Um, uh, operations of airports, um, uh, uh, preventive maintenance, um, uh, route optimization. Those are all typical applications in the aviation space. And then you have weather, which is impacting about a third of the global economy. So everything from, uh, from logistics to construction to renewable weather, right? You know, if you run an, an offshore wind farm, uh, you want to know what is the wind going to be both 
platform, how much power will I produce and be able to send into the net? But also what is going to be the wave state so that I can do maintenance um, on, my, on, on my wind farm, right? Um, uh, so that's you know, a very, very broad application area. Uh, and the one that, that we are particularly passionate about internally as it relates to allowing humanity to adapt to climate change, something that I feel is, is um, uh, despite the current situation, you know, one of the largest challenges of humanity that we face this century. And Spire has like this unique capability, both from a data analytics perspective, to help uh, communities, companies, uh, countries um, adapt to climate change. You know, we provide data to large national uh, meteorological organizations that use then that data to help, you know, it's now almost a billion people across the world have better weather prediction because of our data. And then now uh, the last one is uh, space services, where we basically have taken all of the complexity of leveraging space to solve a problem on earth and wrapped it into a software API. So if, if, if you and, and, and your buddies want to uh, start a space company, you actually don't have to know anything about space anymore. You might have an idea for an application, you might even have an idea for a certain uh, data gathering, um, and you would come to Spire and say, like, you know, I, I, want to, I want to do that. Um, can you give me an API to get this data that is collected in space? And we would say, yes, we, we can. And in a few months time, and for a fixed monthly subscription, you would be able to build your business, focus on what you're doing best. It is literally what Amazon AWS is for cloud computing. Spire is for leveraging space to solve problems on Earth. And has the situation in the Ukraine created opportunities to track things like naval, naval movements and aircraft patterns? What if any business has this conflict or war brought to Spire? So from a, um, a you know, participation perspective, we've been very focused on, uh, 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 on the hum humanitarian aspect and maybe understanding uh, and bringing transparency to it, right? The data um, uh, from space is a phenomenal source of truth and transparency. And I think Spire and other fellow companies have really been showcasing that we are living in a very, very different world today than just you know, three, four years ago. Have any ships or cargoes been affected by the fighting? Yeah, so the, the activity of shipping that we have seen in, in, in Russia and Ukraine is, is actually a very interesting question. Uh, Spire tracks some 17 trillion of global trade by monitoring you know, all of the ships across the planet. Um, and that means you know, we, can, we can look at port operations, uh, we can look at port activity. And you know, what we have seen is definitely there has been a change. You know, that has been coming out of the data we see at least a 20% reduction of activity in, in, in Russian ports. Uh, what I think is most affected there from the commodity perspective is, is you know, it's food, right? You know, we've seen a, a substantial drop in, in dry bulk uh, cargo, for example. Um, uh, we've seen a, 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 a significant change in, in the number of cargo ships leaving uh, Russian ports. I think what is, what is even more, um, you know, almost heartbreaking is the port activity in, uh, in, in Ukraine, where we have seen, you know, a, a, a devastating uh, drop um, over the last four weeks, um, you know, in the extent of like 80, 90%. So yes, there absolutely has been a change in, in port activity uh, for, uh, for Russia. Uh, we see commodities like wheat in particularly impacted. We also see a change in uh, where certain uh, commodities, you know, oil, dry bulk and things like that go. Um, uh, but the biggest impact, of course, you know, we've seen in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, what is interesting is that, um, you know, Western ships is actually quite hard to track because 
the majority of ships don't you know sail under a, a western flag but you know if we look at it right now there aren't any uh, us you know we, we at least have not seen any in our data any 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 us ships um uh carrying the us flags around the uh the russian ports and I've sensed in a couple of your answers that you might be blending the capitalism with some humanitarian efforts. A, is that kind of accurate? And B, is that more of a personal interest or more of a corporate philosophy? Given that I was one of the inventors and founders of the company, those uh, personal goals of me and the founders um, uh, definitely have shaped what company uh, goals and company philosophy is today. Overall, you find Spire being an incredibly mission-driven organization, really with that vision that I had since I'm a teenager of leveraging space to solve problems on earth and dedicating ourselves on a global basis, which is the first of Spire six values and is the one that is, is um, uh, maybe the single most important one, which is why it is also in our name, um, uh, not just for you know a very small maybe rich portion of the population but truly global 8 billion people 192 countries and so yes indeed um uh, we love the ability to have a business that solves truly meaningful global problems that do improve people's lives be that um uh, uh, uh in, on a security aspect or be that on the climate change aspect those are things that absolutely matter and they do motivate us that we can build our business on having a truly global impact every single day with what we do. And who are the clients for your, for your, for your business, Peter? What does the customer base look like? How would you characterize them? And is it, is it more concentrated or diversified? So we think that there is at least about 200,000 customers um, for us um, in, those, in those four segments. Um, today, we serve a bit over 600 of, uh, of these customers, so just a tiny, tiny portion. Um, but because it is such a tiny portion of such a large addressable customer segment, and Spire has truly unique capabilities, we have been able to grow extremely rapidly. Um, and the customers that we're talking to are countries, corporations, and communities. So, um, you know, we talked about the port of Rotterdam. There is a launch company in Australia that is using us for hyper-local weather forecasts. Um, there is a commodity trading company out of, out, of, out of the US that is using us for their information. There is uh, uh, the European uh, government, uh, UMIDSAT, that is using, using our data for, for weather prediction. So it really spans the full innovation spectrum of large corporations, small corporations, um, public service agents or, or governments, as well as, uh, uh, as, as defense uh, uh, government uh, companies that are, that are customers um, of ours. And is the revenue model more subscription-based or do you have some one-time stuff as well? It is overwhelmingly a subscription. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's, it's like almost exclusively, I want to say. Like it's the majority of our business is just a simple monthly subscription where, you know, you give us money, we give you data in all four of our segments. This is what it boils down to. We give you uh, data and analytics that sit on top of the data from us um, uh, through an API as a monthly subscription. Let's chat a bit about earnings. I think earnings came out yesterday. Today is March 10th for people that are listening. The headlines suggest earnings were a bit better than expectations with maybe a small miss on revenue. The shares traded up a bit on the news. How did you feel overall, overall about the report and anything you feel is worth highlighting? You know, Spire had a very, very strong finish to the year. Um, and we, we actually met um, the very, very top end of our revenue guidelines. You know, what you are referring to is um, we had also purchased a company and there was some uh, purchase accounting adjustment um, that, that was happening. But we actually hit, you know, the top line of our um, uh, revenue guidance. We hit top line of our, of our um, uh, EBITDA guidelines. So both on the, um, uh, you know, growth 
uh, perspective, you know, we, we, we grew ARR 96% year over year. ARR stands for annually recurring revenue. Um, this is the subscription business um, that we talked about. Um, uh, we grew that 96% year over year last year, um, uh, as well as on the profitability metrics um, where we hit or exceeded our guidance. And then we, then we talked about uh, this year where you know, we see it just a continued uh, rapid growth of the business projecting um, over 100% year over year revenue growth um, uh, and, uh, and, and hitting over 100 million in annual recurring revenue this year. Um, uh, in, in a very, very fast paced um, uh, uh, time scale, um, probably among the fastest of, uh, of most companies going from 1 million of recurring revenue to 100 million of recurring revenue, all while using the inherent leverage of our business. You know, we got one infrastructure that collects data once and then sells it a million times, meaning that the more we sell, the more we get to amortize this fixed size infrastructure that doesn't have to scale with revenue. It's just a fixed size infrastructure. Um, and that means that our profitability metrics um, are going to improve drastically this year um, relative to last year. And, uh, and we're quite, quite excited about driving both that exceptional, and I think anyone projecting 100% year over year revenue growth at that scale can call that an exceptional growth um, and the same time as we can drive profitability. And we painted a pretty nice picture today, but at the same time, the stock's been suffering. Six months ago, the stock was around $10 a share. It traded up briefly as high as 19 back in September. And today we're closer to $2 a share. I realize investors can be fickle and things can be sold off unfairly. Um, but what do you think people might be missing with the story? Any, do you have any feelings about why the stock's been, been punished? And you know, what do you think might, it might take to turn that sentiment around? Well, I think people, what people are missing is that um, buying a company that is growing its revenue 100% year over year at three times this year revenue is extremely attractive if I think back to my days at being an investor on Wall Street. Um, so clearly that's kind of like what people are missing, extremely high growth, um, uh, very large market, um, very, very attractive um, uh, uh, positioning. Um, but that's my, that's my personal opinion. At the end of the day, I, you know, I, can't, I can't speak for, for, for investors. I think there is a, there's a multitude of facets that probably play into this. If you look around the, um, the geopolitical situation, that's probably not helping right now. Um, uh, there was a lot of talk in, with regards to inflation um, uh, that probably had a negative impact. Um, and you know, as much as we can benefit from being a space company, right? Um, or what we do is almost as much space as the GPS system. And when people think of GPS, they might think more of Google Maps and Waze than of big GPS satellites because it's not very visual. And I think we are a little bit in this category. And if you remember back in the day when the United States government decided to launch the GPS constellation, there were people who like, oh, why do we need to spend tens of billions of dollars? You know, our, our government is pretty wasteful with our money. Um, because it was not obvious to everyone how that will help, you know, people in their everyday lives. Today, there is not a single financial transaction um, that would happen without the GPS system. Like literally the ATM machine that probably every one of us uses once in a while doesn't work without space, without the GPS system. And Spire's use of space is similar in a sense that it's not very visual, but we help companies um, uh, drive a smoother supply chain in a difficult environment so that your Amazon package and your you know, DHL package and your food and whatever else you might order actually might arrive on time. So it is the non-visual aspect where I personally and, and we as a company haven't spent enough time making that obvious to people. Um, also, in all fairness, you know, we are a public company for, you know, six, seven months, maybe. And so we haven't had that much exposure 
like for example today to tell uh, the story of how this company is leveraging space to solve problems on earth when some other um, use cases like uh, taking a picture or, or um, uh, uh, getting an internet is just easier to understand and more visual than the stuff that we do. What do you see as the future of satellite data and how do we get there? Well, I think it is bright um, uh, to, say, to say it simply, it is going to become more ubiquitous. Uh, the number of countries that have operational space capabilities is exponentially growing. And the number of operational space assets that are collecting data from space uh, to solve challenges on Earth is also increasing exponentially. So I would argue that that trend is going to continue um, even on that, on that exponential trajectory. And we're going to see more and more data being collected from space to solve challenges on Earth. If you think about some of the generational um, uh, obstacles that we face, many of them do require and can only be tackled from, uh, with data from space. Uh, one of them are security challenges. Uh, to capture data in uncooperative areas is only possible from space. Uh, be that uh, uh, you know, radio frequency data about what kind of activity is happening on the ground from a communications asset movement uh, perspective, from a um, you know, interference perspective, all of that can only be done from space. I think the, the broadening uh, of telecommunication networks and wireless networks uh, makes spectrum more and more contested and observing who is using what spectrum when and where and how is something that is becoming more and more relevant to both regulators as well as operators. And again, is uh, sometimes very hard to do on the ground, uh, even though for a, a, a high resolution uh, capability, we often have to go uh, to the ground. I think there are uh, numerous places that will leapfrog the deployment of terrestrial needs. Um, tracking of aviation comes to mind, for example, in places like Africa, Latin America, and certain places of Asia, where you have um, large amounts of land mass, but not very developed um, uh, terrestrial infrastructure, and leapfrogging the deployment of costly and potentially time-consuming deployment of infrastructure by leveraging space is, is one of, uh, of the growth areas, be that for the collection of data or for the provision of bandwidth. Um, uh, from, uh, from space. I think we have, we have the challenges of climate change, right? And, and environmental impact, you know, warning of uh, impeding or impending uh, uh, environmental disasters. Again, you need to have assets in space to collect the data, to measure that, to make correct predictions and to provide warnings, which are going to become more and more relevant and more and more frequent as those events just happen at, uh, at a higher frequency. So in summary, I, I do believe that uh, humanity will leverage space increasingly for its um, uh, interests, um, for its uh, benefits and for its, its facing and overcoming of challenges here on earth. And that makes the, the future for data from space very bright in my opinion. Well, this has been fantastic, Peter. Best of luck moving forward, and thanks for joining us on Seeking Alpha. My pleasure. It was great to be here, Jessica.